News Talk 1340 KROC AM. Good morning. I'm Andy Brownell with Rochester Today on a Tuesday. That means Tom Ostrom's in the studio after our weekend. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Andrew. Good to see you. Hope you, you stay dry out there and warm. <laughs> Only 52 degrees. Of course, it won't be that long. We'll be thinking 52 is a pretty warm morning. What do you got in the mailbag? Well, again, our listeners, uh, they're so bright and accomplished, I wonder why they listen to me, but they probably want to listen to you. But, geez, <laughs> here's another one. Rick Foster is his name, and he says, Tom, I've been a listener for more years than I can recall. I enjoy the friendly exchanges you have with Andy when you agree or disagree. Your differences of opinion uh, this morning on the Ebola panic button. I have a question about a medical issue, too, and a comment. Uh, medical marijuana. Now, by the way, uh, Rick is an accomplished teacher, artist, technical guy. He's just one of these eclectic people that, uh, that and his son sounds the same way. He told me about his son who's out in California. Same kind of multi-talented, successful person. So here's what he says, though, here. Uh, he doesn't want conservatives to think he's endorsing uh, the legalization of marijuana, but he says this. My son lives in California and says the distribution of uh, medical marijuana shops system is a joke. So, why not use an already effective, carefully controlled system that already exists? They're called pharmacies. Pharmacies have been a safe and controlled distribution point for dangerous and addictive drugs. If medical marijuana does bring relief to people who suffer medical disorders... Make it available only by prescription from a legitimate physician and dispensed by a pharmacist. Uh, Fortunately, the long history of recreational use of marijuana has muddied up the issue uh, with opponents and proponents uh, who'd like to see the legalization of marijuana for recreational use. He's not talking about that. He's talking about distribution. He says... Consider some highly addictive illegal substances that have found their way into medicine, opiates like morphine. When abused as a recreational drug, it's devastating. When controlled and, dis- and prescribed by physicians, distributed by pharmacists, they bring relief to millions. I think this is the solution to the problem of distribution. I can't argue with his logic. The uh, situation in California uh, is degraded to the point where you have... Uh, uh, people obtaining scripts from who knows who that are honored at these dispensaries. And uh, it's de facto legalization is what it is. The only difference is that the if you do sign up to get your medical pot and it doesn't, the threshold for obtaining a quote unquote prescription in California is pretty darn low. Uh, you do get put into a state registry. So the state of California knows about your marijuana use and tracks your marijuana use uh, through their databases. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people who are into the recreational use of that substance who don't want to be on any state register. Or maybe selling it, too. I wonder if the feds will track their names and watch them. Yeah, I'm not familiar enough with the system. I'm just just anecdotal from folks I know who live out there that Uh tell me that the same thing, Rick, (laughs) that it's it's quite the farce, to say Uh the very least, to... uh, And part of the play here in Minnesota, as far as the medicinal pot business was going on, is uh, there were two forces at work here. You had people who uh, were legitimately seeking uh, medical relief uh, for a number of disorders. Specifically, there's some, I don't even know, because you talk to two sides on the medical side of it, and they'll say there's really no uh, comprehensive um, double-blind testing that shows a real strong benefit to marijuana. You'll hear that side, and then you'll hear the other side say, no, that's not the case at all. We can demonstrate quite clearly uh, these cases where you use the uh, marijuana oil uh, and things like that on children with seizure disorders, and they show a market improvement almost immediately. Uh, there's that facet of the argument. But the other facet of the argument that was going on at the same time at the state capitol was that this was just a beachhead for the eventual legalization of recreational pot. And that that group was extraordinarily disappointed in what the legislature and the governor did because uh, it is so limited at this point. It's almost like a pilot study that the state of Minnesota is doing because the list of ailments that qualify for medicinal marijuana is very short. 
you almost have to be terminally ill or have one of these uh, severe seizure disorders or uh, a few others that would qualify to be eligible to receive the product in either an oil, pill, or vapor form. You won't be able to get it as a substance you can smoke, and there are people who will tell you right away that while the real benefit of medical marijuana isn't so much the actual physiological effect of it's medicinal effect, it's the psychological, psychological the relaxation. The placebo effect. Or even kinda. just the the stress-relieving part sure. of it or or increasing hunger part of sure. it. Sure, and there's the a psycho uh, uh, background, to psychological background to, to immune systems and all of those things. Right. You wonder what those people that made so much money, the criminal element, selling it illegally, now they've got to compete with it legally. You wonder if somehow they're going to figure out, you know, protection money or extortion money or go in and rob those places. They've been kind of set back on their heels in California. I wonder what they're doing to substitute. Selling meth. They're selling heroin. Escalating, okay. Heroin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's always, the, you know, there's always a, an unintended consequence to anything mm-hmm. you do. You know, you put pressure over here. It bubbles out over here, and uh, who knows what the unintended consequence. Well, look at Colorado. The unintended yeah. consequences there is that you have uh, an industry that is raking in, so, you know, in the tens of millions of dollars every month. There's millions of dollars flowing into the Colorado state coffers yeah. in the tax part of mm-hmm. this, but it's a complete cash business because the banks who are federally chartered are not allowed to have any accounts that deal with any of this marijuana money because it's still a scheduled one yeah. drug on the federal charts. Yeah, they're asking for exemptions, exceptions. Right. Yeah. But so these people who are running these pot farms and dispensaries in Colorado are paying all their employees in cash. Mm-hmm. They're every single bit of their business. They can't take a check because they can't cash it anywhere. <laughs> so they have huge amounts yeah. of money involved and there's great fear that somebody's going to get killed because they're transporting yeah. in the hundreds of thousands of dollars on a regular basis and basically putting this money in vaults to store it. And I think the, crazy. I think the feds have had banks uh, be forced to report certain monetary amounts that go right. over a certain level to try to find out the drug lords and uh, I wonder if they're getting in on this complexity too. It's craziness. And I don't... I do. I, I will be the first person to stand in line if you were to ask me if the current model for the war on drugs is successful. I will be the first one to tell you. I think it's been an absolute horrible failure yeah. uh, for a multitude of reasons. I think the uh, the goal behind it was noble. Uh, the The strategy was mistaken and probably ineptly uh, instituted, or what I want to uh, implemented. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, and it's created, in a lot of ways, it's created a monster that was far worse than the monster that we had before. Oh, sure, including the executions of people involved in the business and the danger and the lethality involved with law enforcement officers, undercover people, yeah. But at the same well, time, that's your unintended consequences. Right. But at the same time, I'm also very extraordinarily fearful of throwing, throwing in the towel and saying, let's have a free-for-all and you go ahead and do whatever you want. That's I, I right. I think that, yeah. that, that could be a disaster of... That could even be potentially a worse disaster. That's right. And then I read in Colorado with the legalization of marijuana, people have gotten high and been driving. So now there's a driving under the influence of marijuana. And one of the first victims of uh, marijuana-induced stupor uh, was a highway patrol car Is that, that right? got whacked <laughs> By a Colorado marijuana stoned. user. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're, it cannot be good to be driving stone. No. Let's put it that way. All right, we got to take our first break already. Tom, it's 20 minutes past 10 o'clock. It's 52 in the downtown. Roscoe's Root Beer and Ribs. The Root Beer stand is still open. We're going to have some nice weather this week, too. So mm-hmm. the barbecue uh, joint will be a great place to visit. And don't forget, the fish fry is still on with the delicious hand-battered Icelandic cod with either Jojo potatoes <laughs> or the fries, your choice, coleslaw, and uh, the delicious garlic toast. That's uh, the fish fry at Roscoe's on 4th Street. Oh, yeah, the handmade coleslaw, the... The 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 baked beans, the the award winning barbecue sauces, and I went in there the other day and I saw on their board uh, at the A and W stand uh, barbecue turkey, real turkey meat, a sandwich. So I got the beans, the coleslaw, and a great turkey sandwich. Oh boy, Roscoe's yum. Roscoe's root beer and ribs, the 
4th Street location of the Rubbier Stand open as long as the weather holds with the fish fry, the world-famous Roscoe's Fish Fry. And don't forget the North location, which is by Shopco North, and it is open all year round. News Talk 1340 KROC AM. Good morning. Andy Brownell with Tom Ostrom. It's Rochester Today, a regular Tuesday program. You can hear a replay of the program later on today on KROCAM.com. And, of uh, course, uh, be uh, sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And I don't know, there's the YouTube channel, and I'm sure there'll be other things down the road. But you can find us where you need to find us. But uh, go to KROCAM.com, and they'll connect you to all that business. And you can win prizes there, too. Uh, there's a little column uh, near the top of the web page that says Win Stuff. And you go on there and you sign up. And what you're signing up for is to be what we call a VIP, I think. And uh, don't worry. You're not going to get bombarded with uh, phone calls and, <laughs> and uh, junk email. And what you will likely get, though, is like once a week you might get a newsletter from us that talks about some of the top news stories of the week and maybe some things coming up where you could win prizes and that sort of thing. Don't, so, no uh, junk, no junk, okay? How do they get it? Go to the website, carosyam.com, go win stuff, and then it's got a little thing you're going to sign up. And you probably uh, just okay. put your email on it. And like I say, you're not going to get junk mail from us, okay? Okay. You're not going to get phone calls unless you won something. Yeah. Then you want the okay. phone call. Good. I know a lot of people worry about that. I worry about that. Uh-huh. When I go to these things, I sometimes are leery to put anything down because I don't want to be bombarded <laughs> with garbage, so. Okay. <laughs> you might get a newsletter, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so calm down. Yeah. All right, 26 after 10. What do you got for The us, liberal Thomas? media. They're just furious with Leon Panetta. He he was uh, President Obama's CIA head, and then he was Secretary of Defense, and he, he's a Clinton person. And he wrote a book now, and, and he's going after the president on his failure to act and to send clear messages in the Middle East, the history of, uh, of missteps. And and the Benghazi thing, he said, look, I told the president in the phone call that evening it was terrorism. It, it wasn't a video. Uh, and he's got, he goes on these liberal talk shows. Fox News loves him. Liberals go after him. They're just furious with him. Charlie Rose uh, uh, and, 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 and some of the others, they, they call him a trust. They're scolding him, and they're calling him a traitor. And they say, why didn't you wait till you were out of office? And uh, you're hurting him at election time. And... Panetta stays cool. And I think you hypocrites in the media, when George Bush had some of his aides go write a book during his term of office, and when Reagan did, oh, the media made those authors heroes, but oh, not Panetta. Yeah. But he stays cool. Gosh, he's cool. And when they get through tirading at him, he says, I like the president. I want him to be successful. I'm giving him an advice because he's got two years to go to be a better president. Then they don't know what to say. Um, but uh, 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 some people are speculating Panetta is so pro-Hillary, and he worked for oh. the Clintons, that he did this to sandbag Obama and Biden and make yeah. Hillary look good, except the inspector general of, uh, of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Department of State has come out with a scathing report and all the ineptness of Hillary uh, in funding and in tracking funds and in security lapses and in ignorance. So I don't know. It's going to be a tough campaign for her. But Pan- Panetta stays cool when he's being interviewed, especially hostile interviews, and they don't know what to do with him on the left. Well, the flaw to that theory is that, okay, if you really seriously think that they're going to put Biden up as a presidential candidate, yeah, huh? That's all I can say. Mm-hmm. What? Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. But what do you think of Panetta's? Well, number <laughs> one, he's, number one, he's selling a book, and, and, and all the more power to him because uh, ultimately, uh, if you, I, I have no issues with that at all. And this is his take on what occurred there, and I happen to uh, agree with him in large part on his take. And I think there are a lot of folks who were observing the happenings out there especially in the Middle East, as far as our foreign policy is concerned. And we're horrified by what we saw as mixed messages and, uh, and vacillating back and forth on a lot of it things. And, you know, you, you tell the Israelis, you chide them one day, and then the next day you give a speech saying that we will stand by the Israelis no matter what. And, and then you go over here and you tell the Saudis one thing, and then the next thing you know you're uh, – uh, secretly negotiating with the Iranians without telling the Saudis and their arch enemies without dealing with that dynamic in that part of the region. And that's part of the part of the issues we're, we're facing mm-hmm. today, as far as Syria and Libya and Iraq. Ultimately, the two two axes of power 
uh, in that part of the region are the Iranians and the Saudis, and if you are going to be playing one side against the other over there, you better be ready to deal with the mess it's going to create. And you've got the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, saying, look, we're probably going to have to have boots on the ground. Look, I, uh, ISIS has, has got a straight shot to the Baghdad airport. We can't allow that. We've already, And he said we've already got uh, helicopters uh, with Iraqi troops. That's combat. And so the, the, the policy seems to be uh, falling apart there in the Middle East. And, and of course, the Turks aren't helping. Oh, Secretary Rice, who went out and said uh, about the Benghazi video, now she's on TV saying the Turks have now volunteered to get involved and help us. And the Turkish government right. said, no, we didn't. We didn't say you could use our Air Force base yeah. for the launching attacks on it. You know what frightens me in a lot of ways about this, and there's so many ways to be frightened by this, is that how many parallels there are to the fall of uh, Saigon following oh, yes. the Vietnam War. And and it's not just the military side of it. It's the economic side of it. It's the the um, the political side of it and also the potential aftermath of this uh but what's even scarier about that is that when saigon fell to paul pot and uh or actually i'm sorry no with to, the, the hanoi yeah uh, hanoi the North yeah. Vietnamese, but that also colonel led, bui tin but, but that also led, colonel bui tin that, was the man on the lead tank for the north vietnamese <laughs> just a fact there and but that also led to the fall of uh cambodia and and the resulting killings and the bloodbath that oh, occurred yeah, in that Khmer part of the world. Yeah. Khmer Rouge, But also in Vietnam. Uh, you also had camps that were yeah. taking place, and re-education camps in sure. Vietnam as well. And But that was a contained regional mess. What was happening there didn't have the potential to become uh, a global threat. No. This has a severe potential right. to become right. a global threat. In fact, the Vietnamese communists want us to put our Navy back at Cameron Bay because they fear the Chinese, as they have for centuries. <laughs> yeah, in that part of the world, we've we got to take a break for news. We could keep talking about this a lot more, but it's 53 <laughs> in the downtown. Kim Davidson, in the news center, and he's coming up next after we talk about our friends at Carol's Cup at Carol's Corn down on the subway level of the Kaler Grand Hotel. And don't forget that Carol's Cup out at Apache Mall in the food court with the delicious frozen yogurt with all of those wonderful toppings of your choice. You choose the size of bowl, how much you want to put in the bowl and what you want to put on top of the yogurt, and then you pay for what you what you took based upon how much you took. I, I just love that system. It is. And uh, Seattle's best coffee, I was in there this morning. I know how to work those little pumps and uh, put the coffee in and give them the money. And Now, uh, Mike and, and Pat have explained to me, uh, Mike runs the yogurt shop and Pat Carroll, they, they explained to me about the yogurt that you mentioned, Andy, and now Andy, and now they got seasonal flavors in the yogurt. They got peach yogurt. I tried some. Oh, gosh, that would be it was good. good. They got pumpkin pie yogurt. They got selected uh, caramel corn taste in their yogurt. And you can ask them if you want something. So, with their respect for me, I said, "Okay." And I bought the peach. That was good. The I peach said, "Okay." Good. I said, "Why don't you? Why don't you have a chocolate malt flavor uh, <laughs> yogurt? Why don't you do that?" And they just stared at me. And Mike says, "Well." Uh, why don't you just put chocolate yogurt in, put it on the counter, and go away for a half hour, come back and drink it. <laughs> so, But they're so creative. They're so friendly, and um, they love ideas, and they're cooking all the time. What, that beautiful corn and confectionaries and sundries, but uh, yogurt. All right, Carol's Court and Carol's Cup subway level. Kaler Grand Hotel and Carol's Cup out at Apache Mall in the food court. KROC AM. 22 before 11 o'clock. I'm Andy Brownell, Rochester today, along with my friend Tom Ostrom. On a Tuesday morning, 282-1234 is our phone number if you would like to chime in, as we'd like to say. And, Tom, we've had a caller on hold through the news break. Good morning. You're on KROC. Good morning, Tom and Andy. Morning. Hi. Hi. Say, this is Jim Baker. Oh, Hi. hey, Jim. Hi, guys. Hey, I want to let your listeners know that... Uh, Thursday evening, the Rochester Tea Party is hosting a must-see event on one of the key issues in the election, and that's Obamacare. And we're going to have two of the nation's leading experts on health care, Dr. Lee Carisco and Dave Racer. And they're going to lay out the impacts of Obamacare and what it means to our future. And to say a little bit about each of those guys, uh, Dr. Carisco's Canadian, Interesting guy. He practiced uh, medicine in uh, Canada's nationalized uh, 
system for many years. And then he moved to the U.S. so he could uh, practice medicine in a free market. Only a few years later to find out that Obamacare arrived. And uh, he wrote a book that received national acclaim called uh, Healthcare Reform, The End of the American Revolution. And then partnering with Dr. Crystal will be uh, Dave Racer, who's an outstanding speaker, pro- prolific author. And Dave has written numerous books on the U.S. healthcare system and is really one of the few Americans who really understands its uh, the impacts of Obamacare and its attack on the Constitution. So this meeting, once again, will be held uh, Thursday evening, day after tomorrow, uh, October 16th, 7 p.m. at the Eagles Club. And then just remind people, the Eagles Club is uh, located just north of Cub Foods at 917 15th Avenue Southeast. And our meetings are always free and open to the public. And I hope some of your listeners will come uh, and, and uh, hear these guys on this really uh, important election. You know, it's so important, Jim. Thanks for the information. And uh, I've read that illegal immigrants are enrolled in Obamacare. they got to get them off. Uh, a dozen states plan to cancel health care policies not in compliance with Obamacare, and that'll happen before the election. And universities, even the liberal ones, are canceling their health insurance policies for adjunct professors and for student workers, saying we can't afford the costs. And so these liberal universities are having a war on women because then they're canceling people's free contraceptives. It's chaos. It is just a mess. And here's here's an opportunity for us in, in three weeks from today is to, uh, and we've got several of our legislatures, I guess the three, all three of them that represent uh, Southeast Minnesota, who, who voted for this thing, and it's uh, a chance to really kind of understand the, the depth of the impacts and uh, in hopefully make a, an informed uh, voting decision here in three weeks. All right, Jim, th- Thursday at the Eagles Club. Yeah, at 7 o'clock. Okay. Thank you, guys. Well, yeah, thank thanks for you. your call, Jim. Yeah, bye now. Bye. Speaking of uh, Obamacare, there was a new report put out that was based upon an analysis of the uh, budget office, the federal budget office's um, cost predictions or projections on Obamacare, and uh, they revisited it. And it was the, uh, I think it was the Senate Budget Committee ordered this thing, that uh, the original report came out and predicted that the um, Affordable Care Act would have, uh, would actually lessen the federal deficit over a 10-year span by somewhere between 100 180 billion dollars, right? Well, now they've revisited it a year after implementation and looked at a variety of factors, including uh, the impact on Medicare uh, and revenue sources, and a lot of this dealing with these exceptions we've talked about uh, where uh, people or groups were allowed not to abide by the rules of Obamacare in and the, in the last fall, remember, we had all of these small businesses all of a sudden, you're going to give another year, da 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 da, da. That had an impact on revenue. So now the revisited uh, uh, projection puts that uh, Obamacare will actually increase the federal deficit in a 10-year span by uh, upwards of $100 billion. Bucks. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. The, just, and that was predicted as well. Once you start monkeying around with these things <laughs> yeah. in there and granting... Uh, basically bending the rules for political reasons are yeah, mm-hmm. once again sure. there's going to be consequences but the one thing i did want to talk about tom but we haven't talked about a lot lately is this uh, whole business of clergy sex abuse and it's how it's rocked the catholic church and of course anybody who is directly involved in it particularly the victims uh of the crimes that occurred uh in most cases decades ago the state legislature uh opened up a window where the statute of limitations has been suspended for Uh, people who were children decades ago, to file lawsuits in order to try to obtain some sort of justice. And that has resulted in uh, in a settlement that was announced yesterday by the Archdiocese and the Diocese of Winona. And I I, I just applaud everybody involved in it at this point. I think um, from what I've heard and saw watching the news conference, it, it seems as if this thing has finally got to the point where the church is opening the doors mm-hmm. and, and in, instead of uh, sparring or parrying with mm-hmm. the attorneys involved and in representing these victims, uh, 
you can we can finally hopefully enter that phase of uh, really really fixing the problem and making sure it never ever ever happens again, while at the same time uh, finding a way to um, apologize and try to make amends to the victims, because what the church has basically agreed to do, thank goodness, is. Uh, from this day forward, instead of forcing these people to go to court to obtain the records of the church about priests or other church staff substantially, or I think it it would be substantiated or uh, allegations of uh, criminal sexual conduct, they will fully cooperate without having to litigate access to the court records and access to the people involved, and it'll be uh, an outside group will be monitoring this and assisting with these investigations. And now going forward, instead of going to court to decide on what sort of monetary settlement that these uh, uh, mainly grown men at this point uh, will be receiving uh, to try to, I guess, uh, you know, as part of, uh, what do they call it? Uh, there's a term for justice. Um it's, I'm drawing a blank. I'm not a lawyer. Sorry. Uh, you know, the monetary payments that they'll receive. Yeah. That yeah. They'll mediate. Compensation the or compensa- something. The, the damages. They'll try to yeah. get together and find a way to make this work. That they Compensatory can, damages. Right. Yeah. Well. So I, I think it, I think the whole thing is finally, uh, hopefully, uh, it, it, you know, the one man who spoke who was a victim a long time ago said he's still skeptical, but he's very hopeful that this is finally what they've been looking for all along. An apology. And a, and a concrete program to make sure this never happens oh, again. Oh, sure. And uh, that's surprising me, even in the Winona Diocese, the number of priests that have been accused. And then you think of all of Minnesota, and then you think nationally. Uh, now, some people say, look, the percentage of wayward priests, most of them are decent and good and holy oh, yeah. and caring, and the percentage of uh, sexual deviance in it uh, are no greater than the percentage of, of other help-caring professions, uh, uh, teachers and uh, social workers and everything. Well, that's fine, but you still expect a little bit more from the people who take uh, – they take the uh, order, holy orders. But I, I was so upset by you and I are Roman Catholic. We'll say that so listeners right. don't think we're bashing the church. We're glad for the progress, too. But I was so upset by it. Um, and I was glad my dear Catholic mother went to heaven before all this started. I don't know how she'd have coped with it. I, I was upset so much I wanted to leave the church. And Mary, my d- devout wife, said, look... People are people. There are bad people and good people. I'm not letting bad people, uh, whatever their percentage, uh, force me away from my church and its sacraments and its beliefs. I'm not letting them win. They win if we leave. Uh, That kind of slowed me down a little bit. But I'm pleased that the church is. Now, Winona's kind of worried about bankruptcy, the Winona Diocese and all that. But it had to be done. It's being done well. And, uh, yeah, the horrible uh, shame and, and, and fright uh, to victims. Uh, I think part of it, too, Annie, I'm going to get in trouble here. You always make me think. Now, my brain's going faster than my mouth. Um, uh, pro- part of the problem was when the, uh, in, the, in the progressive 60s when the seminaries got uh, overly tolerant and, uh, uh, and, and, and weak in its admissions policies. And I'm going to put it that way and, and then be quiet. Two eight two one two three four is the number. By the way, I figured out the term I was looking for: restorative justice. That's oh, the term I want. Okay. Good morning, you're on KROC. Hi there. I'm sorry. I think I uh, dialed the wrong. Number. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> you gave us a chance to cool down. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't looking to cool down. You mentioned that the percentages of people who find their way into positions of power who are sexual deviants who are um, predators. Uh, and, and I agree with you, uh, especially when you look at, uh, you know, whether it be uh, whatever profession it would be that would give you access to young children. And it's truly frightening that there is that percentage out there and everybody should be aware of that and also uh, on guard against that, that uh, oftentimes these predators have a way of masking their true intent by seeming uh, to be these uh, uh, well-meaning yeah, youth people. counselors and everything. Yeah, they yeah. are uh, mm-hmm. they are sociopaths who uh, should truly frighten you. But when they came out with the list for the Winona Diocese, what really scared me 
was I recognized three names on that list of people I had personal contact with as priests. Hmm. What are the statistical odds? Yeah. Yeah. That, that was. And wow. Yeah. We have to take a break already. It's uh, 10 minutes away or 11 minutes away from 11 o'clock here on CAM. Victoria's Restaurante and Wine Bar. The catering that they can do for you at Victoria's for whatever event you have planned is uh, going to be exemplary. Let's put it that way. I've been to catered events with uh, Victoria's Pasta Bar, and it was fantastic. <laughs> the, you get the choice of different pastas. You get the wonderful bread. You get all the wonderful things that you come to, to associate with the Victoria's, and it's brought out to wherever your, your event is taking place. And uh, they just want to make sure that you uh, keep them in mind. As if you're planning a holiday party, a uh, a wedding, a birthday party, a family reunion, whatever it may be. The great pastas, the chicken and the pork and the mushrooms, uh, uh, the wonderful salads and the desserts that they'll provide. And, the, yeah, the appetizers are great. A great wine list, too. And like I said, I went in not long ago and asked for uh, uh, mushrooms and onions, sautéed uh, products and chicken to put into my cabbage soup. And uh, they made that up for me. Well, I had a good glass of their delicious wine and huge vat. I still got some of it. Oh, gosh, it's good. <laughs> they'll do anything for you that you ask, and they'll have good advice in addition. <laughs> That's Victoria's Restaurant and Wine Bar. They're in downtown Rochester on First Avenue Southwest. Six minutes away from 11 o'clock, I'm Andy Brownell with Tom Ostrom on the Rochester Today. Coming up on Friday, Tom, you're on assignment again. We're going to do another candidates forum, this time with the candidates for Olmstead County Sheriff. Mm-hmm. So both the Sheriff Dave Mueller and uh, his challenger, Captain Kevin Torgerson, will be uh, coming in for interviews. Talk, uh, Give them a chance to introduce themselves, tell, tell us why they want to be sheriff, and uh, what are the issues facing uh, the Sheriff's Department in the community, and uh, get you some more information. As we oh, great. Towards Very November important. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of law enforcement, the Secret Service had a prostitution scandal several years ago in Latin America, and and this administration loves to procrastinate and delay uh, controversies till after elections, which they did till after the 2012 election. Uh, Janet Napolitano, who administers the college system in California, was contacted, and she said she played no part in 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 delaying the the release of the uh, uh, investigation. Um, uh, but the White House insisted then that no White House staff was involved. Now we know that a member of the White House staff was, and his father and he now work for the State Department. The White House returned a contribution fund to the to the dad now that this came out, i.e., uh, the Secret Service prostitution report was delayed till after the election and uh, of 2012. And then the Army isn't going to release the Bergdahl review. Remember uh, Sergeant Bo Bergdahl? Oh, was, sure. Uh, 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 captured by the Taliban, then released in exchange for Gitmo terrorists who were uh, sent back home. And the Army isn't releasing their review here because uh, Bergdahl's college said that a colleague said that he deserted his post, and, and that's how he got captured. And uh, President Obama, to get him back, released some Gitmo terrorists. And the Army said, no, it's not political. We just have this. The, the investigation, though, will be released. Um, and, of course, after the uh, next election. Oh, okay, so they're yeah. saying it's not done yet. No, it, well, some people think it is, but they're delaying because of the election, the well. release of the report. But that's the politics that's evidently played. I think it's another uh, uh, cover-up, but that's another controversy. So um, uh, politics everywhere. Politics, 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 you betcha. Anything else you want to cover before we Well, a congressman up? insists uh, that 10 Islamic State fighters have been caught trying to cross yes. the U.S.-Mexican border. That's oh, Representative Duncan Hunter. Uh, he had information from the Border Patrol warning about this. Uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security had uh, Jay Johnson said no. He didn't know anything about that. And then later he said, well, I heard some were held, but it's being uh, resolved. But uh, and then what another to be resolved. Yeah, well, to see to be studied to see if they oh. really are. Oh, okay. And then the Southcom commander warns that he thinks an Ebola-driven mass migration will come from south of the border. That's Marine Corps General John Kelly. He said they're going to have these uh, coyotes and everything else get people from Africa. They're already down there to get them across the border like they do everybody else, charge them a lot of money. Those that want to come here that think they might be diseased 
to so they can be treated here. They think they can be treated here, and it uh, takes 21 days of incubation, so uh, it could be a loophole. And I think if he's too politically incorrect, Major uh, Marine Corps General Kelly might find he's going to be retired soon because uh, he's, he's made this speech publicly. Uh, and Yeah, I mean, anything... Uh, uh, Everything drives movement of people, and whether it, the, the difference would be if the 21 days thing is a big deal, because yeah. the, that's the outside of it. Most people become sick a lot quicker than that. Okay. So get, actually getting here and doing that within that time frame is going to be difficult, but I can't deny that it could happen. Sure yeah. it could. Uh, yeah. We live in a topsy-turvy world right now, Tom. Yeah. And it uh, it is interesting that... Uh, Things can change so quickly. You know, and I, I read a piece recently, too, um, that, uh, in fact, it just came out today, and it was kind of shocking to me that uh, uh, this group does a, a study, and they don't do it all the time. I think they only do it every four years. And it ranks the nations based upon economic freedom. And the idea would be that the more economic freedom there would be, the more prosperity or potential prosperity you could have. And since the last time it was done, uh, the United States has dropped from number two in the world to number 12. And largely the study, which was built upon a lot of things and a lot of factors, but, uh, you know, regulation is a big one, uh, government regulation, um, the the strength of the rule of law in, in that country, uh, and Canada and Australia are ranked far above the United States. Oh, yeah, and Canada's going to run that pipeline uh, out of the United States and, and west. And the communist Chinese have bought the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. For, <laughs> they're making money. Well, Although I heard their economy slowing down a little bit, too. But actually, you should be heartened by that because the, these countries, including these, uh, the money that's coming from uh, the Middle East, even into our own community, they consider... Us to be a safe investment yeah. that somebody's not going to blow it up with a <laughs> bomb or yeah. something like that. Yeah. All right, Tom, I guess we'll see you in one week. Yes. And don't forget to tune in Friday for the Candidates Forum featuring the candidates for Olmstead County Sheriff, including Sheriff Dave Mueller and, of course, uh, Captain Kevin Torgerson, his challenger. We'll air that on Friday. Uh, coming up tomorrow, the city attorney will be in the studio with Tracy McRae and myself on Rochester Today, Terry Atkins. Well, stop by. Hopefully it'll be a nice day, and uh, he'll be able to have a wonderful walk from the downtown. It is uh, 53 in the downtown, 11 o'clock at KROC AM Rochester. Time for ABC News.